Hi everyone. I'm going to show you some of the new breeding techniques that we've learned over the last three years. And um, this is just one of the techniques, but I find it the most simple, and it's actually one of the one of the easiest. It's not one of the most productive, but it is definitely probably one that you would want to start out with if you're first time trying to breed California newts, trachea torosa. And what we have here is my last pair, and this is actually my spawning tank here. Of This just has eggs and one very young male. He's first generation. Uh, he's about, should be coming up on three years old. Depends on if you count out of water or not. But I count from the hatch date, but that's not necessarily always true. And see, these are the eggs he's been guarding. One, two, three, four, five clusters of eggs. A couple of singular ones. What I put in here for food for the hatchlings is... Uh, they like to eat bloodworms. They also like to eat aquatic flatworms, aquatic blackworms, and um, snails. Uh, little pond snails. These are common if you're in the... Let's see. These little snails right here, they breed like crazy. They have little tiny, tiny babies. They don't get much bigger than that. The newts like to eat them up too. And they're a pretty good source of food. Uh, baby ghost shrimp and baby a mono shrimp too. Uh, now a mono shrimp don't breed in fresh water. They will lay their spawn in the fresh water and it has to go into brackish water in order for the spawn to continually to grow but the newts will eat up the little spawns and that's also pretty good food source or I recommend these tadpole bites if you can get them to eat them right here these are from HBH they eat them up but just a variety of foods if you can get a hold of them in almost all aquariums if you have ever had one or if you want to consider breeding ghost shrimp, it's very simple. Uh, just Google it, and you'll see how easy it is. Um, the babies of those, they have tons of them. The newts love to eat them up. They're a good source of protein. And they have a good source of calcium in there, too. Um, I have all kinds of different shrimps that I breed, and I'll give them little... Uh, I'll give them some of the shrimp that I breed if they're not of the color that I want of different Neocardinia shrimp. Um, two, if you ever have an aquarium, you usually run into these in your substrate. They're just regular worms. There's flat worms and there's round worms. They don't ever harm anybody. They don't ever harm the shrimp. But people don't like the look of them. So what that is in there is that's just a little trap with food. Uh, has tiny holes, the uh, worms go in and they have no reason to leave because there's tons of food in there and then I pull it out every once in a while and I put the worms in the newt tank and then the baby, the baby spawn of the newts, they eat them right up. It's a great source of food. So to get back onto the breeding portion of this, what I have is I keep my male in here. He's very protective of his eggs that he's fathered this year. I only have one pair left. The rest have gone off to um, just a couple other researchers, some other people who were who were involved in the breeding of this, and this is the new th pair that I wanted to keep. The toughest part of this whole thing is getting them to go into their aquatic cycle. That's a very difficult thing to do. In order to do that, you have to have the lights on a timer, and they have to follow it just quite the season. Starting in about August, I lower the water level of their tanks to just an inch or two of fresh water. And that kind of indicates the dry season. And then I let it get a little bit warmer. It will get up to the 90s in the summertime where they live. And so I let it, I let it get pretty warm. I don't let it get, you know, past maybe 85, 86, but it'll get, it'll get decently warm in there. And then come the rainy season, I start, I, we fill it up, and the rainy season is supposed to be November 
December, January ish. And this year, our rainy season was all off, but they respond to the weather changes. So the easiest way to keep the water cold, and that's one more key, is then you have to drop the temperatures and raise the water temperature, or lower the water temperature, I'm sorry. Um, there's two ways of doing that. One, I use bags of ice. Uh, if you want to add water to the tank, you can just go ahead and put ice in there. When we're using some of the bigger tanks, uh, if you've ever gotten ice cream in those um, like three gallon round jugs, I would fill those up with water and freeze giant icebergs. I used to call them these just new icebergs that I'd have to freeze for the bigger, bigger tanks and that would keep it cooler. That's the cheapest and hardest method to, to keep it cold in there and you want to keep it very cold once you switch the water up. But if you want to go an easier route you can always get a water chiller. Um, those are a little bit more expensive and eventually we switched over to that method. Uh, you can pick up a water chiller for aquariums anywhere between $800 to $1200. So you're going to spend a lot of money on those but if you plan on doing it with ease it's definitely a worthwhile investment and there's a lot of different kind of water chillers out there if you have any questions about that you can go ahead and just ask me I'm not going to go into that right now but so this is going to be the last breeding of this year it's already late in the year I only have one female this is a, another thing about their aquatic cycle it's not just the males but the females need to understand that it's the weather is changing it's time to start swelling up with eggs so the raisin water and the, the cooling of temperatures indicating the rainy season is it's really the best way to go and I keep the males and the females separate uh, no real logical reason behind it but the scientific reason behind it is just so that we can keep track of the eggs and when they're being laid and whatnot. You'll see that in just a minute. And so this is my last pair. My females elsewhere and you'll see what we're going to do with her later. This is the male down in here. Uh, looks like some of the eggs have gone bad. Now you can remove... Let's see if you can see those. One, two, maybe three eggs are no good you take those you can either take them out or you can leave them in um, the only reason I leave them in is because I have flatworms in here flatworms like to eat dead uh, rotting anything they won't eat the anything alive but they'll definitely eat the e dead eggs and in turn the little newts once they hatch will eat the worms so it's kind of a back and forth on that if they start to decay too much and there's not enough worms to finish off the dead eggs. There's a few more dead eggs back there. Those singles didn't seem to turn out too well, those four. But everything else is pretty healthy. Uh, it'll mess up your water chemistry if nothing's going to take it out. So, As you can see as a substrate, I'd use granite rocks. Now these are actually from where the newts live. Uh, they live in streams and the water is pretty hard so you don't want soft water I don't recommend using RO and if you do use RO you can remineralize it but um, you can test your top tap water is actually quite good I have a normal filtration system for drinking and that mostly just takes out the chlorine and not too many of the other minerals so the water stays nice and hard and that's that's what they like to thrive in. This right here is a sponge filter. It hooks up to a simple air pump. I have sponge filters in everything. Uh, they're one of my favorites for biological uh, filtration. They do a really good job. This is a pretty small one for this tank, but there's not a whole lot going on in here. Uh, in this tank, I do maybe water changes once or twice a week because I don't have very many live plants in here. I prefer fake plants for doing this. I don't like fake I don't use fake plants in my aquariums. But if they die 
or they're not doing well, then you start to have spikes in nitrites and nitrates, and that's not something that you really want. So rocks and fake plants are good. I have a couple of live plants. I got duckweed up there. The bigger stuff is frogbit, and this this plant here is uh, tropical hornwort. I think that's the only living plants I have in here. They're real; those are really hardy plants, and they're almost impossible to kill. And the second thing about rocks, having rocks, particularly granite, is rocks are a natural filtration. I'm gonna keep the water clear. And you can look that up later, I'm not going to go into detail about that, but this is a good substrate. If you choose to use a substrate, you can choose not to. Um, I've written a care sheet about just not using substrate. But if you want to, I would recommend using, you can use aquarium. If you look in there, there's some aquarium rocks mixed in there. Uh, I just happen to have a lot of this granite, so I thought for this particular breeding tank I would just use granite rocks and this has been running for three months and it's been doing quite well there's no algae growing mostly because there's more snails than there are anything else and uh, just the one newt and these eggs have been developing and there's many little babies in there swimming around but you won't see them for quite a while because uh, I have big rocks for them to go in and hide in and I'm not about to go in there and just start mixing things up to upset everything but everything's been going quite well in here for quite a few months and so I'm gonna show you what we're gonna do next and go on to the next part of this breeding video this is the second part of the breeding video this is where I keep my female at least for now um, once they're done breeding and the breeding season's over they're just gonna go together in a nice bigger tank but for breeding purposes this is what I have them in uh, trachea torosa are out during the day, and you can see this female. She is, she's fat with eggs, and she's ready to breed. And she's been eating well too. She, I put these ice cubes in here to make them feel a little bit better because they do prefer colder waters, and that'll kind of put them at ease. Um, you'll see in a minute why I keep them separated, but she's actually real happy that I put those ice cubes in there. And she's young too, she's about his same age. In fact, she is his same age. She's probably, more than likely, closely related, maybe even his sister, I'm not quite sure. But she is, she's not very old. As you can see, she's not very big. She's first generation captive bred. Uh, she's probably two years old, maybe three. But she's ready, she's definitely, she's already laid two clutches of eggs for me and she swelled up with eggs again and so I thought well I guess we're gonna go for another lay which actually is quite common sometimes they'll lay multiple clutches and multiple times um, I've seen them lay maybe three egg sacs of the, some of the bigger females I've seen three egg sacs laid and I've seen them do it three times a year within the breeding season so you make sure that they're well very well fed uh, dusted crickets fruit flies make sure your crickets are gut loaded if you use crickets worms snails a wide variety of food is what I provide for the female and very high in protein very high in calcium because she's pumping out a lot of eggs she's gonna need it just like any reptile or amphibian so this is where I'm going to put them together to breed and mate and they will lay, she'll lay her eggs and I do it in the middle of the day. If you notice this isn't at night or anything, these newts are out during the daytime. They are not nocturnal. They are, they are a diurnal species and they are out most of the day and they breed in the daytime. They don't breed at night most of the time. They're just out in the day. And so I'm going to go get the male and I'm going to introduce them to, to each other and Hopefully, you'll get to see some captive breeding. So, I have Prince Charming here to go in with the female. He's big. He's definitely in his aquatic cycle. You can see his fat tail there. And he's been eager to breed. He's already bred this year. And he's been protecting those eggs. They, that's what they'll do in the wild. They don't have much of a defense. They're very 
chill newts. They're very nonchalant. But in the breeding season, they you touch the water, and there it goes in the, into there. And they will just come in after you. They don't really have much of a defense, except if you're familiar with any newts, you should know that all newts are toxic. These being some of the most toxic of newts. Their skin will excrete tetradoxin, which is the most powerful neurotoxin on the planet. Um, I've only got TDX poisoning once from newts. It was a very small amount, but it was enough to scare me. Though that water's really cold. And so I'm going to put them together. Let them just kind of, they'll court each other. Sometimes the mating takes a short time. Sometimes they get it over with within 20 minutes. So I'm going to let them get used to each other. It shouldn't take very long before they start doing what they do. And I'll start the video back up then.